All right, this is show number 79, recorded on April 2nd, 2013, and our guest tonight is Seth Castile. Seth, did I say your name right? Because I'm habitual with getting my names wrong. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Seth Castile. Okay, great. Uh, normally, we have a little bit of intro, but you know, guys out in chat, if you'll wait until the end, I'll, I'll, there's a couple of things I want to cover at the end, but uh, Seth is a, a really busy guy, and we're lucky to have him tonight, so I want to go right into Seth and, uh, and talk about you know, what he does. So if my first question is, how long have you been doing photography in general? Not necessarily just uh, pets or anything, but how long have you been into photography? Is this something you've done well, all along? Well, I got started... I'll try to do a long story short because yeah, I like yeah. to ramble. You but go I ahead. I got started about uh, in 2002. Okay. That's the first time I really even picked up a camera. Uh, so I moved to Australia. I was living in California. I moved to Australia to do a study abroad program. Bought a camera, took it along, and just got fascinated with photography and Australian wildlife uh, while I was over there. And, you know, everything from wallabies and kangaroos to the poisonous snakes. Uh, the bird life, uh, turtles, everything. I just got absolutely fascinated with it all. So that's kind of where it started for me. Um, I guess it's about 11 years ago now, ish. Then you, so you went to study abroad there for uh, photography or some other subject? Uh oh. Uh oh. I think we just lost Seth. He looks like he froze. Filmmaking in college, and I decided to go to. No. Oh. Am I here? Yeah, you froze for a second. <laughs> so, oh, oh, gosh. Okay. The, only, the only thing I heard was filmmaking in college. Oh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> so I was studying filmmaking in college okay. and decided just to have an adventure, go to Australia for about uh, seven months, um, pursue that a little bit, but also pursue photography and business and Australian history and a little of this, a little of that. I've always wanted to go to Australia. I said, I'm just going to go. So that's kind of where it, it started to make sense for me. I didn't realize I was going to be photographing so many animals while I was over there, but I did. Have, have you always had a passion for animals, even from a, a young kid, or is it something you Oh, did? yeah. Ever since I was little, I grew up with pets. I had a little dachshund named Duchess okay. uh, that I grew up with, and she lived with me for 17 years. Um, and I think she really inspired my love for animals and especially dogs. But I had all kinds of pets. I was always like the guy down at the creek trying to catch frogs. <laughs> <laughs> Even when I was like in high school, yeah. people were like, why aren't you at the pool hanging out with all the ladies? And I'm like, nah, I'll be down at the creek catching frogs. <laughs> <laughs> so you were probably really popular with the ladies uh, if you were the guy catching frogs in high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not so much. <laughs> well, well, what are you going to do? You got to do what you want to do. So... So, th so when did you decide that uh, photography is what I want to do for a living? And, and then I guess the next question it would be, and that would be uh, animals. I would be for doing animals for, and maybe pets for a living. Yeah, so the Australia thing was great. I lived over there for about seven months in 2002. Uh, I just had the most amazing experience. Came back here to the United States, obviously finished college, finished my filmmaking studies, and got into movie advertising for several years. Um, and, and kind of put photography on hold a little bit. But then, um, sort of unexpectedly, I was reintroduced to dogs and cats, and that led me to this career that I have now. And really, one of the big factors was I was working at, I don't know, if, can I tell the story real quick? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was working at Sony Pictures Entertainment in Culver City, working in advertising, designing moving posters for James Bond and Spider-Man and that kind of thing. And it was a really cool job. Um, but I certainly like my job better now. Anyway, we found these little homeless kittens that were living on the studio lot, and there were some friends of mine that would take care of all the kittens. They'd find these kittens, and there was lots of adult cats actually living on the lot. We'd find these, uh, these homeless kittens, and the idea is to get them adopted out. Well, sometimes there's so many kittens, I said, hey, well, maybe I could take some pictures. Remembering, I mean, I still liked photography, but I said, maybe I can take some pictures and we can help the kittens find homes, attract attention. So we snuck the kittens into this executive's office over at Sony. I uh, let them just crawl around on the furniture and everything and took some snapshots. And through those pictures, all the kittens were adopted. I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. Wow. Of course, a couple of weeks later, we found more kittens. It seems like uh, during certain parts of the year, there's uh, uh, unlimited kittens. But yeah. found more kittens, took more pictures. All those kittens found homes. I thought, hey, that's, you know, that's actually pretty cool. So I started volunteering at a local animal shelter in L.A., at the West LA shelter, doing the same thing for dogs and cats, okay. and and that's kind of what led me to this path that I'm on now. So really, the the charity work is what brought you to do it for a living, and not the other way around. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, huh. You know, I would have never expected to be photographing dogs and cats for a living or be a pet photographer. But, you know, just through the course of doing this volunteer work, it kind of it, it worked itself out. And it was yeah. not expected, but it was, it's been a nice surprise. And I, I got to imagine somewhere along the path when you decided I'm going to try and make a living from uh, pet photography, that somebody had to tell you, Seth, there's, there's no living in pet photography. If you want to make money in photography, it's got to be, <laughs> you know, I'm sure they went down a short list, wedding, maybe seniors or something like that. Um, those kind of things that that's, that's really the only place you're gonna make a, a decent living from and oh, of course yeah and and a lot of people you know were generally just concerned I mean people that were close to me say family or friends some people were just concerned that I was gonna be the guy who was just kind of the, the rogue friend or rogue family member who was ultimately living in a shack and asking them for a few dollars to go get a sandwich somewhere I think people were just concerned <laughs> about me because it wasn't a very uh, stable existence being a pet photographer. Right. Uh, and, you know, some people even went further and just laughed at me. What do you do? I'm a pet photographer. I mean, a lot of people thought it was a joke. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess the, the immediate reference is Ace Ventura, a pet detective. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what people think. But, you know, I th do you think that maybe, um, you know, at least from when I was a kid, uh, we had dogs. We always had dogs. But they, and while we felt they were a family member, you know, they were more outside dogs, and you didn't interact with them the same way. And as I've grown up, you know, our dog, my our dog now, and the dogs we've had in the past, they're in the house. They are a big part of the family. If we were to take a family portrait that was not in a studio setting, the dog would be there. Uh, do you think maybe people's feelings toward their pets have changed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look at 50 years ago. Yeah. Look at 10 years ago. I mean, the idea of pets being part of the family is becoming dominant now, in the United States especially. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look at what's happened to just the pet culture, the pet industry. Look how much money is being spent in the pet industry. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, yeah. And that's all changed really. I mean, I think I got into pet photography at the right time. Mm -hmm. I think when I was starting out as a pet photographer, there was maybe five or six people doing pet photography in Los Angeles either part-time or full-time, just very few. And now somebody said there's a, a 200, over 200. Well, I got to imagine uh, as, as they see your success, that's going to drive even more of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny enough, I've actually got a lot of emails from other photographers and pet photographers saying, hey, you know, thanks for bringing what we do uh, into the public's eye so people really know they can hire a pet photographer. And it is something that makes sense. You know, a lot of people... Uh, several years ago, they think that's a joke, and now a lot of people realize, hey, there are people who do this, who photograph pets for a living, and they have maybe some advantage with their skill set or their connection with the dogs and the cats where they can actually capture a personality in a photograph. Yeah. And, you know, I would think, one, as we talk about, it opens maybe more competition for you. It probably makes the market, though, bigger, too, as as pet owners see these photos and see those things. Probably more of them want photos that may not have considered them in the past. Yeah, I'm not really worried about competition too much. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I never really have been. I've just kind of been doing my own thing, living in a bubble. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's great. I love to see how many people are, are photographing their pets. I mean, I would imagine that, you know, pet photography in general, whether you're a professional or you're just somebody who likes dogs and likes cats and other pets, that's probably the one, one of the most popular subjects to photograph, if you do anything with a camera at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, I have so I mentioned I have a black lab, and I yeah. I find it very difficult to take photos of her. Good photos when she is a puppy, and uh, is a little bit easier. But now, you know, now she's older, uh, I find it very difficult. So that just shows you know the skill and both your interaction with the pet and your photography skill to get these photos. Because uh, I I gotta imagine that you don't walk on a scene and just start snapping photos. You got to make a connection with the animal, don't you? Yeah, there's a connection. It's funny. I hear stories from these big advertising agencies who are hiring, you know, really super famous like, photographers who are used to working with models, and then they got to infuse dogs into the into the frame, into the campaign. They're working with dogs or other animals, and it's a disaster. And I've heard several stories about these top shot model photographers who are used to just telling, "Hey, you look hot," you know, yeah. uh, or or whatever, whip your hair around. And it's a whole new challenge when you're working with animals, as they figure out. Right. You got to, you got to work with what works with the animal. So, so what uh, took you from? Did you start with like dry land? I mean, you started with dry land, just 
taking photos of, of dogs or in, in cats in a normal setting, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I just got started doing the, the volunteer thing, photographing these cats really in, in an office, indoors, natural light, um, and then started doing work outside with dogs. Um, you know, really the mission there was just to take a, a better picture to result in an adoption. That was the concept. But through that, you know, I, I realized that I'm interested in the emotion of pets, specifically, really, the emotion of dogs more than anything else. And I think I, through the course of doing that and showcasing these unique personalities, that really kind of opened up the doors for me and my pursuit for this passion of mine. Yeah, you know, uh, so I'm particular to dogs too. Uh, cats are fine, but I'm particular to dogs. And and my feeling of dogs is that they, they want to be happy. You have to do so little for them to make them happy because they want to be happy. Uh, and then you do a great job of capturing that that happiness. And as I'm saying this, there's a picture of the two Dotsons. One of them looks like he's got a big smile on his face while the other one's licking him. You know that shot? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is hilarious. A um, lot of people don't realize those are sisters. <laughs> 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 uh, Which is I would have thought they were boys. Yeah, I just I just found out that that picture is going to be on the cover of a um, a greeting card at Trader Joe's, and I think it's like a, it's like a a romance card or something. <laughs> and I have to laugh at that because people don't people don't realize that they're actually sisters, Roxy and Molly. That was done in L.A. a couple of years ago, and you know through the course of figuring out their relationship, they're two sisters. They're absolutely obsessed with each other. But especially Molly is obsessed with Roxy yeah. more than the other way around. And you can figure out if you separate them a certain way and, and put one here and the other one there, and then you reunite them. Uh, the reaction is always going to be very strong, especially from Molly towards Roxy, who wants to kiss her sister. <laughs> and at some point, you would know that they're, they're two sisters or they're two girl dachshunds. But I don't even think it matters. It's really just about the moment. Yeah. And, and, and guys out in chat, if I miss a few of your questions, uh, we'll come back around to them a little bit later. Um, and I'll try and work them in to the show, too. So what brought you, what made you first think, you know what, I'm going to jump in a pool, if, if the pool was the first thing, I don't know that, but uh, what made you think I'm going to jump in the water and get that, get a photo that way? Dog jumped in the pool. Simple <laughs> as that. Do, you know, doing an on-land shoot in Orange County, California a couple of years ago, um, a little Cavalier King Charles Spaniel named Buster decided he would rather be in the pool than on land. And, and I was actually supposed to do on-land shots of this dog and a couple other dogs. Just on land, obviously Cavalier King Charles Spaniels look a little different dry than they do wet. <laughs> but Buster decided he would rather just, and I didn't even know there was going to be a swimming pool there, but he would rather be in the pool. So he started jumping in the pool on his own. I didn't even, I didn't even instigate that. And he was chasing this little tennis ball. Uh, that it was his favorite tennis ball, and he was just jumping in chasing it. I'm just watching this. And, of course, you know, the dog owner is like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, now Buster yeah. is all wet. This is terrible. And I'm like, no, I think it's okay. You know, let's let's roll with it. So I didn't have an underwater camera left. Got a little point-and-shoot hot pink camera. Oh, I have it. Hold on. I have it right here. <laughs> okay. <Look>. <laughs> so while he's getting that, guys, out in chat, um, you may have to put your questions up there again, especially J.C. Wells. This thing. Wow. Look at that. I mean, some of the, the pink has been sort of uh, – it's been rubbed off. This is a Sony TX5. And it's underwater? Several years ago. It can work underwater, I take it? Yeah, it just goes under a few feet. But, you know, I just I leave and come back with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and did my very first shot of Buster underwater, actually with a point-and-shoot camera. And not even any flash. I just had really good ambient light in the water. And I think I have that image pulled up. And I know you can't see what I'm, I'm talking about right now, but I have that image. It's Is it got like a blue background of the pool? And, and his teeth are out. You can't really see his eyes. You can't see his eyes, but the tennis ball is to, you know, to, I guess to his left. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Uh, and that was done with this. This is supposed to go down to, oh, this is a, it's a TX5. It's supposed to go down to 10 feet. Okay. Um, and, yeah, that's what I did. So I left. I came back with this, did that shot. Didn't really, I mean, watching him, I was like, wow, but didn't know what kind of pictures I had. Went home, and I was like, wait a second. <laughs> and that's what really inspired me to continue to, to pursue this. I mean, that's a great, it looks like he's smiling there. <laughs> you, you, you know, that's a, that's a good point you brought up, Tim, because I have shown, uh, ever since I, I found your page months ago, um, I have shown people, look at this guy. Look, these shots are amazing. And some people, that's the reaction. They go, oh, my God, those things are so awesome. And a few people who are, I think they're afraid of dogs, they go, oh, that's scary. That looks scary. <laughs> and I say, I say, no, hold on a second. Look at the photo again. It's, yeah. The dog actually is, is not mad. I, and, yeah. and, and this is the way I'm interpreting it, so you can tell me if I'm wrong. He is 
just excited. He is loving he or she, right. lo the loving the thing, and, and maybe even as much as a dog can, smiling about it and just having a, a great time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. All these dogs are having fun along the way. I mean, like Buster, his favorite thing to do is, is to swim, and that's yeah. it. He loves it. He loves chasing his ball. He'll dive in over and over again. He has an absolute blast. And, and that's the thing I think that I just picked up on through the series is dogs, a lot of dogs love the water, and they have a connection with the water that a lot of them don't even understand they have. Yeah. I mean, it goes back a long time. It goes back to wolves. It goes back 20,000 years ago. And some of these little dogs, like these pugs and these cavaliers, even chihuahuas, some of these dogs that they may not be that closely related to wolves anymore, um, they still have some of these instincts that are in there somewhere, and they, they start to have this introduction to the water, and they remember uh, how much fun it can be. And, you know, this is I've said this in a few interviews, but I think – it's terrific how people spoil their pets, spoil their dogs. Dogs that sleep in bed with you, they have the best <laughs> treats, food, expensive toys and all this. I think they love it. I think they embrace it. But I think they also appreciate the chance to explore their wild instincts. And that's what the water does. That's why these dogs yeah. are so excited about it. You see all these emotions and reactions because they have that connection. Yeah. And so now this is not a, a – his mouth is the actual mouth that was in the water. It's not, it almost looks like it's been exaggerated with Photoshop. No, no. Right. You know, I got in, uh, uh, with a lot of these pictures. A lot of people thought they weren't real. Um, just the reactions. Right, that's what it almost looks like. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people thought that the reactions were fake. They were like, "Oh, these can't be real. Tennis balls don't sink." <laughs> I, I love that one. I was watching a Reddit post, and um, uh, tons of people said, "Oh, these are fake." You know, but tennis balls don't sink. I'm like, really? Have you ever thought about just cut a hole in a tennis ball? I'm pretty sure it'll sink. Yeah. <laughs> most of the balls that I use are just the squeaker tennis balls. You know, it's it's these. So it's Ooh, not even real. It's not it. a real tennis ball. Yeah. Right. Right. So it'll have, yeah, some water will get in it. It's a squeaker it. tennis ball, and you know, it's got a hole in it. If you squeak it underwater, certainly That's allows cool. some water in. And I'm so used to doing this. I just control the buoyancy of this ball, so I can sink it. I can let it float mid water, a couple of feet down. Um, I can sink it fast. I can leave it on top. Whatever I want to do with it, it's great. Now, I mean, eventually the dogs are just chewing them up, and uh, then maybe you have to get another one. But somebody in chat just said that that you when you squeak that, their dog jumped up. <laughs> 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 that's that's awesome. So, uh, do you find you he's know, barking the house down now? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know my dog, my uh, the black lab. She would. She would live in water, uh, but you know, not all dogs maybe take to the water quite as easily. Do you have some you got to work with at first? Uh, does the age of the dog affect any of that? Where you need to work with them a little bit more before you can coax them into the water? You know, age doesn't really matter a whole lot. I mean, I've worked with young dogs and dogs that are that are 14 years old. I'm actually working on this new book now, Underwater Puppies, which is going to be all dogs under six months. But you know, the age thing is not a huge difference. It's really just confidence. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen dogs that have never been swimming before, and they they come swimming with me. We figure it out, and within within five or ten minutes, they're in swimming, chasing tennis balls, putting their face underwater with confidence, and they're having fun along the way. Now, it is true not all dogs will participate in this. I mean, I've worked with some dogs that just say, you know what, it's not my thing, <laughs> including my little poodle mix here, Nala, who I've got this big painting in the background. She's just not a water dog, and I think she's actually a lab mix. I don't know what happened there, but she's just not into it. She doesn't have a retrieve drive. She's not interested in swimming. Um, if I work with her for, for months, maybe, but I, I think some of these dogs have it or they don't, and yeah. they realize it pretty fast. I mean, it's incredible to watch this. Like my book cover, that's a shot. This is Duchess, the black lab. She's never been underwater before, and within a matter of a couple of minutes, I had that cover shot. Just that fast. Wow. It just happened so naturally. Yeah. So, so now, you know, what percentage of your photos in, in just roundabout are water versus dry land? Because I imagine, you know, you still do quite a bit of dry land too, right? I do, yeah. Um, probably like maybe like 50-50. Okay. 50-50. I mean, the water thing is still really exciting. I'm just, obviously, I'm shooting a new book, um, Underwater Puppies, and working on some other projects, but... It's probably 50-50, but I, I love I – mean, there's a lot of things that I can do on the land that I obviously can't do in the water. Uh, no matter where I'm at, it's always about the emotion of dogs, wherever that brings me. But there is still some unfinished business in the swimming pool, so yeah. I like to be in there. I've got to shoot tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Uh, with a French bulldog. Really excited about that. Awesome. 
And uh, now, you know, so at one point, you had to go uh, graduate from that little pink camera to, yeah. to something you can shoot with underwater. You know, yeah. uh, a DSLR, I imagine, underwater. And yeah. you had, I imagine you had to buy a housing, some kind of housing for it. Did you get any kind of special housing or just a normal, you know, diving housing for uh, the camera? Yeah, I rented a few different dive housings. Um, I mean, I kind of researched it all. I, I, I rented a few, but even to rent a dive housing for a weekend with strobes, you're talking about $500. Yeah. Uh, sometimes more than that, just to, just to rent one for a weekend. And I didn't have too much money <laughs> to do that. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is really adding up pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I ended up, I actually graduated from this thing to a camera bag. You can buy these like plastic bags yeah. to put your camera in. And um, I use those, but you got to be so careful with those. I just, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to sink your camera that that easily. So, but I had a little bit of luck with those, and then I ended up getting into the surf housing thing. So now, I pretty much shot my entire underwater dogs book with a surf housing. So it's essentially a plastic housing designed for surf photographers to photograph waves and surfers. It's lightweight. I've also got a flash on board with that, so it's a flash housing. Um, so I'm illuminating my subjects. I mean, it's, it's terrific and it's not super expensive, but I spent the last several thousand dollars that I did have available to me on my visa credit card, uh, <laughs> on that, <laughs> my friends, oh, my friends were so upset. They're like, why would you ever do that? I said, Hey, because I have to. <laughs> well, you know, now, you know, now I'm sure they're saying, okay, that was the right decision, Seth. Um, well, I, I think they were wondering how can I monetize that? You know, sure. I mean, I was making kind of a radical decision to spend a few thousand dollars but I couldn't afford to spend on a camera to go underwater, and they're just thinking, you know, why, why are you going to make money doing this? <laughs> I said, I don't even care. I said, I, I'm really interested in this. I think there's something going on here. i got to explore it. And this is what I always encourage photographers to do in general. If there's something that they want to do, there's something they want to try, something that they need to explore, there's a passion there, you got to find a way to do it. you got to find a way to do it. And even if you get yourself in trouble with a credit card, it's, it's worth it. Yeah. Now you um, you mentioned last night that you know, and just now you're talking about it, is that you know this is a passion for you, um, and to pursue something like weddings, you didn't have the passion for that. So, you know, it's like um, doing something you have a passion for is you're probably going to have more commitment to it and be better at it. So you probably yeah. felt like that, you probably felt like that's I have to do this. Like you just said. Yeah, I mean, I, if, now if you love weddings, if you just love weddings and you're a wedding photographer, I'm sure your work, is, it's going to show in your work. Mm -hmm. If you're a wedding photographer and you just hate weddings, I'm sure it's probably going to show in your work too. Yeah. So I thought, you know, if I'm doing weddings, maybe I could get a little bit of business. Maybe I, maybe I could stay afloat a little bit longer. Um, but I'm also diverting attention away from what I'm really interested in. And then the bottom line is I'm not going to produce great work as a wedding photographer. My heart's not in it. I'm a, I'm just going to be thinking, hey, I wish I was in the pool with some dogs. The whole time. <laughs> now, um, so you know, do you have do you have a lot of competition now? I think you mentioned that earlier. Somebody out in chat's asking that. So I think you mentioned that you don't usually worry that much about competition. But would you are you thinking anything about doing workshops on how to do this kind of thing, or is that too soon to be doing that yet? You know, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe one day. I mean, I did do a couple of uh, video clips with Good Morning America and Inside Edition, some of these TV shows, just kind of showing some of the basics with how to work with the dogs. I imagine if I was doing a workshop in person, you know, for a couple of days, probably it would be easier to learn. Um, but I probably won't. I, I, maybe one day I'll do some workshops. Right now, I'm just... I'm kind of focusing on some other things. Yeah. So, but yeah, there are other people that are doing the underwater thing. I mean, I've been seeing some pictures pop up on the web. Somebody sent me a picture the other day saying, hey, I love this shot of yours. Hey, it's not my shot. <laughs> and, and I have a photo up there right now. That that looks like a ferocious picture of these two dogs going for that little red ball. It, it, the picture is, uh, looks like a gold, maybe a golden retriever on the right side. I can't really tell what's on the left. And there's, I don't know what you call that ball. It's a pink ball. That's got oh, I know the it. shot. Yeah, it's called sharing is caring. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's done. Um, that was done here in LA, and that's actually a border collie named Nevada and a yellow lab named Bardo. Yeah, uh, and that was done. I guess about a maybe about a year ago or so. Okay, uh, and, and, and that was actually. <laughs> I don't even know if I want. There's a long story for that, but I love that shot. That was extremely difficult because that was done basically at night. Yeah, it so, does look very dark behind them. 
Yeah, it's very dark, and those dogs are extremely close. Now, this is a, a tricky shot because it's really hard to pull this off with most dogs. These dogs have a relationship where I knew them, I could work with them, and I could pull this shot off where the dogs aren't going to accidentally injure each other. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty ferocious, but these are dogs that are ultimately teammates, and I was able to construct it in a way. I mean, the timing of this w was extremely challenging, and I don't have, it's not like I have 100 of these shots that I can choose from. I mean, this is pretty much it. And I, I wanted to you know, ask you about that because I looked at a video, and I don't know how, if this video was uh, how you always do it, but you're not wearing scuba gear. You're holding your breath when you go under there. Uh, oh, yeah. At least what I saw. And when the dog jumped in, you weren't snapping off 100 shots. It was, I think the video I watched, you took two shots. <laughs> and I was, yeah, and that, one, that video, you know what's funny about that video? It was that, that video I put up on purpose a while ago, and I left it up because I'm using a dive, I'm using a dive housing. I'm not in a wetsuit. Um, I'm not even wearing a weight belt. And the dog's not even going underwater that much, and I take two shots. Yeah. So it's <laughs> funny because... A lot of people saw that. I was forwarded to people. And in case anybody uh, wanted people to see it because then they would say, oh, this is how he's doing it. It's not true. That's how I – that was my very first – that was like one of my very first underwater shoots. This was some splash dogs. I was experimenting. I did a little bit of video. But I, I put that up and I left it up to kind of throw people off. It definitely threw me off. Well, I'm thinking, holy crap, this guy is a – you know, I still think you're amazing, so I don't want to take that away. Uh, but I said – Two shots, and I know the second. The second one looked like there's nothing. He couldn't have got much out of the second one. So the no, first... and even the first one, that dog is just splashing. I mean, there's really not a lot yeah. of underwater stuff going on there. But I will tell you, you know, remember if you're in in a really bright um, setting, if you're in a pool outdoors and you have sunlight on there, and you can see in the book, there's a lot of shots that are like that. Recycle time on a flash of any sort, even with high powered cells. If you're if you're blasting off a flash at full power, even even two thirds or three fourths power your recycle time is going to be super low. And I, and I don't have crazy batteries. I don't have crazy strobes here. Yeah, so I've got yeah. just high-powered cells. So I'm only getting to get one picture per second and a half. So you know, when you see that flash go off a couple of times, uh, that's, that's pretty much how it was in really bright settings. Now, if I'm in a, um, a setting where there's lower ambient light, the flash doesn't work as hard, then I can get a faster recycle time. My flash can boom, 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 boom. But with the really brightly lit shots, and you want to illuminate that dog's face, you're pretty much going to get one, so you really have to have the timing down. And you and you're using a wide-angle lens too, right? So you're actually pretty close to the to the action. Oh yeah, I've had a number. I mean, my port has all kinds of scratches. I actually sunk one of my housings because a dog smashed through the through the port. I'm that close. The dog was totally fine. I was worried about the dog, but yeah. down in Florida, a dog named Cowboy. You know, I'm sinking the ball, and I've got my camera here, and the dog's up here, and then just. Comes down too fast. Really kind of powerful, powerful pop going after that ball, and bam, and cracked it. Just punched a hole straight through it. And you can imagine how fast that water's going to come in yeah. <laughs> to your camera. Yes. Oh, I said, my. And I heard it, and I just flipped my camera and pulled it out. And fortunately, I mean, water had already come in, and it was all over the lens, and it was starting to get into the camera, but I was able to pull it out and dry it off and, and air dry it out. And it actually didn't, um, it didn't ruin the camera or the lens. It just... I lost a thousand dollar port, which was kind of a bummer. Oh. And obviously, I don't even have camera insurance. <laughs> I should probably get, should get camera probably. insurance. Yeah, well, things have changed yeah, until they find out what you do, and they say, "Yeah, no, we're not doing that." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, things have changed for you a little bit over the last year or so, right? It, was it last February, February or so of 2012, where things changed for you a, a little bit? Yeah, yeah. February 10th is the day that the pictures became popular on the internet. Yeah, and, you know, you had worked quite a bit before that, so it wasn't, uh, you know, it did change pretty fast, but you had already built up a decent portfolio before that whenever it kind of went viral. And, yeah. And overnight things kind of changed, and, you know, since then, and you got all these links, and we'll put, we'll put links to your site and to your charity and all that on our, on our post, too. But since then, you, you know, had the pleasure of, of being on uh, Good Morning America, Today Show, USA Today, all those things, even recently Duck Dynasty. Uh, which has <laughs> become one of my favorite shows recently, um, but that is also now helping you also on the back on the other side too to go back to your charity, and yeah. you know a lot of people w who I think a lot of people get famous first or, or rich first and then go back to uh, go do a charity. You kind of were already doing a charity, then got to where you are now and are using that to help your charity work too, right? Yeah, no, it's great that I have this opportunity. And now, because of Underwater Dogs, I have an opportunity to team up with other charity partners like Greater Good Animal Rescue Site, Pet Finder, 
um, John Paul Pets Pet Company. Um, it's just a terrific partnership. And now I can do, you know, before I was one guy going into animal shelters trying to make a difference. And now I have these amazing charity partners who can help me take the message that much further, inspire other people to come into shelters and make a difference through better photography and increase adoption rates. So it's terrific. And this is something I've been doing. I mean, ever since the beginning, I got started with the cats, then the dogs and the cats. I started my own nonprofit a couple of years ago teaching these workshops. So I've been doing this across the board. I thought, you know, if you could find a way to help and make the world a better place, I think it's our responsibility. I've been lucky. Dogs and cats have been very good to me. I love that I have an opportunity to, to give back and help them out. So, you know, this new program, the website's actually onepicturesaves.com One picture is, saves our new, is our new uh, effort. And that's uh, going to start April 27th, actually in New Jersey with our first workshop. The public's invited. You can sign up. We're going to do seven workshops across the United States, and then we're going to keep adding them on. And the idea, again, is just to teach volunteers and staff how to take better pictures of homeless pets to increase adoption rates. Yeah, no, that that is awesome. Because you know, my wife uh, is a teacher, and during the summer, she takes my two boys, and they work at uh, a local pet shelter here in our town. Uh, and the one challenge, of course, is that she doesn't come home every day with another pet. You know, I, I can only have so many. Uh, but the, you know, they do that, and you you know, the fact that uh, the photos that generally you see of pets, they they don't look that good, and they're not that appealing. And like anything, you're marketing the pet. You want the pet, the guy, the person to find a the dog to find a good home, the cat to find a good home. So this is a, this yeah. is a great charity, and uh, something that you know photographers can take a um, can get real pleasure from going to a local you know uh, pet. Uh, what do you call it? A pet. Um, what do you call them? Yeah, pet shelter. Pet shelter, and taking photos, uh, you know, volunteering your photo, your your work there, and helping out the the pets find a home. That's awesome. Absolutely, and this is with private rescue groups or or public shelters. Either way, there's so many organizations in communities around the United States that need help. You know, and, and a lot of the tough, uh, you know, the tough situation is a lot of these public shelters where there's so many dogs and cats that need homes. They don't have the support they need to really take great pictures. I mean, usually they. They don't have enough staff. It's not their fault. They don't have enough money to get the job done. It's not their fault. And they're just trying to focus on the well-being of the animals. But do they have a lot of time to take these great pictures? They don't always do. And they always don't have the budget to even get a decent camera, even a point-and-shoot camera. I mean, it's, it's incredible, you know, what they're trying to work with. So we're trying to inspire especially volunteers to come in and team up with these animal shelters and rescue groups to make a difference. Yeah, and i got to imagine it's a real joyful thing to do, to go in there you know, you, and take these photos and interact with the pets. And, you know, you, you're going to walk away from that just having a great time. Oh, that's great. That. You know, yeah. Some of these people say, oh, I can never do it. I can never go in there. You know? But it's such a positive experience. I mean, you go in there and you're spending some one-on-one -on -one time with so many different dogs and cats. Which is which is terrific for them, and you're taking a picture that can save a life. I mean, it's it's a win-win. It, does the photographer get to find out uh, later if the pet was uh, adopted or anything? Yeah, well, it depends on the shelter that I'm at. I mean, okay. you got to imagine again. There's there's so many things going on, sure. but I do uh, try to keep tabs on it, which is which is always great. I mean, there's no better feeling to find out that you've taken a a picture that really showcases, you know, this pet this dog or this cat, and then they find a home because of that picture. It's like, yeah. hey, there's no better day you can have than that one. No, that, that would be awesome. Uh, no, I'm not going to ask you what your favorite dog or favorite um, breed is to, to photograph, but I am going to ask you about, like, like my black lab. Do, do black dogs like that pose a challenge uh, with, with the photography? Because it does, it does a challenge for me at times to take photos of her. Yeah, I mean, it gets back to some of these basics with photography. I mean, you know, working with black dogs, the lighting is always an issue. And, you know, working in a shelter environment, for example, you know, and you don't have the right gear, people are always complaining they can't see the dog or the, the picture is out of focus because the dog's moving too fast. Really, you know, you, they're just not getting a fast enough shutter speed based on their settings to, to get a sharp picture. Yeah. Um, for me, I love working with black, black dogs, black cats. It's no problem, but certainly there's challenges. I mean, you just got to understand... You know some of these some of these principles of photography and practice and practice. I mean, the cover of my book is a black lab indoors <laughs> in low lighting, moving extremely fast in potentially unclear water, and you can still you know you can still get a shot. And the water is so clear in all these. Do you do you bathe the dogs before? Do the owners yeah, have? You gotta, you gotta remember to brush them out. I mean, the yeah. clarity of the water is so important, and it gets compromised pretty fast. You know, I mean, these dogs, even if you brush them out, they're obviously going to be carrying dirt, 
uh, on them sure. and particles, and you're just going to have that disperse. And then, of course, imagine dog hair. Oh, I mean, yeah. I shed pretty quite a bit when I go into the water, but these <laughs> dogs, even if you brush them out, you know, you get some of these golden retrievers or a Newfoundland or something or a Bernese Mountain Dog in the water. It's just, I mean, I got a wolf in the water one time, and she brushed the wolf out a little bit, but the wolf got in the water named Grayson and just the entire pool oh, was wow. was wolf hair, wolf fur. <laughs> So you then do you clean it out then and then get ready for another shot? Yeah, I mean once that once the the pool gets super dirty, you just can't get shots anymore. I mean I did a I did a shoot in Chicago, I don't know, a year and a half ago, and I, I said, Hey, is the pool clean? Is it is it clear? Said, yeah, it's pretty clean. I said, What does that mean? Like, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> clean. I show up and you can see your hand maybe about maybe a foot under the water, you can see your hand. Wow. But after that, I mean you couldn't see what's on the bottom. Yeah. We had amazing moments happening. I said, Oh, this is never gonna work. I tried anyways, dogs jumping in, the moments were there, but the photos aren't there. You can't see anything, you just see blur. I mean, especially when you're using flash, it just illuminates all the particles, you can't see a thing. Yeah. So you gotta have crystal crystal clear water as best as you can anyways. And, and so I imagine these are at the, the client's, the client has a pool or have access to a pool. That you, you yeah, can. yeah, it's client's home. Sometimes we use hydrotherapy pools for dogs. These are popping up around the country, which are great. And most of these are places for dogs that are recovering from injury um, or they're rehabilitating from a surgery. Sometimes dogs are swimming there for recreation just to get back in shape. They're really, really good places. So I use those pools a lot too. And they have great filtration systems on these pools. And of course, you know, safety is number one. The water's clean. Everything's great. So I try to use these pools as much as I can too. And now I'm looking at one now that looks like it's actually in the outside. Yeah, uh, it's it's. I can't tell what kind of dog it is. Maybe a um, uh, a boxer. I'm not sure. I can't really tell, but it looks yeah, like it's outside. Yeah, you got the foliage behind it, and uh, it actually looks like there's dirt in the water at the bottom. Yeah, but it looks like the dog's kicking up uh, like sand from the bottom. Oh, that's probably in the Puget Sound. But the water itself is actually really clear to the dog. Is yeah. the water kind of green? Yes, yeah. yes. Oh yeah, that's Sadie. Uh, that's that's in, that's the only shot. Well, there's a couple of shots I did with her, but I, the only non-pool shot in the book is of Sadie in the Puget Sound. That was done in Seattle, just kind of on the spur of the moment. I was leaving Seattle, and I I got a call from a lady who wanted to hire me to do an underwater shoot, and I said I didn't have a pool, and I'm like, why don't we why don't we do the sound? So we roll out to the Puget Sound, uh, just outside of Gig Harbor, actually, outside of Seattle. And there were seals out there cruising around, and we went out there and did the shoot, and the spectacular. I did a lot of cool over-unders out there because you can see yeah. you know, the natural environment. And the water turned out to be really clear. It's definitely a little bit tinted green. And, you know, when the dog starts kicking up the sand on the bottom too much, then you got to move to a different part of the water. But that was a really fun shoot. I just had to have somebody watch out for seals. The seals were coming in really close to us. Oh, were they? Were they? I don't know how seals and dogs get along, so I just kind of kept the seals uh, away from us. Yeah, I guess that could be a problem there. Yeah, so I noticed in a lot of the shots, a dog. So it's, a lot of times, the dog is looking at the ball, but also sometimes yeah. they look like they're looking at you. Yeah, is it the, is it the housing of the camera that are uh, you itself that they're focused on sometimes? It's the housing. The housing's bright yellow. Okay, and I left it to be bright yellow just as a distraction because I I often use you know the yellow wherever it went. I mean, I'm often using this color. Sometimes I'll bring in different color tennis balls. No matter what, it still contrasts with the water. So if they can't find it, and the ball is all over the place, they might swipe at it and miss it or try to try to bite it, and it goes over here, and then they're looking around for it, and then they see, <laughs> they see, they see me with the housing, and so they move in. I mean, I've had some dogs bite, take a bite at my housing, you know, not on purpose, just thinking, hey, it's a tennis ball, but they're looking right at me, and, and <laughs> that's all deliberate, keeping the color of the housing yellow. I, I just, lo we put up another photo, and I just love looking at the expressions on their face. It, <laughs> it's like it's another world. It's, it's like they've let loose, and this this is my other uh, personality that you haven't seen until you put me under the water. It's just it is just amazing to watch them and hilarious. Oh man, it never gets old, especially when you're underneath there watching them. I mean, the pictures are I love the pictures, but I even more than that, I love just being under there and just watching because there's so many things that are happening, and I'm only able to capture a fraction of. Them. Right. Yeah. This this dog here with the ring in its mouth, it's it's like at the face of. Yeah, nobody can really see what my face looks like here. He's grinning. His eyes are looking sideways at the camera. So it's a great shot. <laughs> He's got. Yeah, he has the ring. Is it an orange ring? <laughs> yes, yeah. it is. That's. Da I think that's Dagmar, Chesapeake Bay Retriever. 
That's her 10th birthday. That's at an outdoor pool down in uh, like Fort Myers, Florida. <laughs> and, and she hilarious. was so funny, man. She was so Question funny. just came up. A couple of questions came up. How deep are you under the water level for these yeah. shots? And what length yeah. lens do you usually use? Sure. So some of these shots, I'm, uh, I'm not under the water at all. I'm in the water. Uh, I have my camera housing, and I obviously submerge that. So sometimes it's like that. I mean, I try not to be under the water unless I have to. Okay. Some of these pools are really cold. Even with wearing a wetsuit, sometimes I'll do 10. I'm in the pool for 10, 12 hours a day. The dogs, oh, are never, wow. you know, a do the dogs are never in there that much. Usually I'll do 20 minutes with a dog or a half hour with a dog. Maybe we take breaks, bring in some more dogs. But sometimes I'm in there for a long period of time with very few breaks. So I learned pretty quickly that your core temperature is important to, to stay up. I mean, right. if you start losing your core temperature, you start losing your functionality, and then you can actually get hypothermia. I mean, divers know this. You can get hypothermia being in water that's 85 degrees if you're in there too long. Wow. So some of these pools are sometimes they're in the 50s or 60s. I did a shoot in 47-degree water with a dog. That's pretty cold. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I don't. If I don't have to put my face under or my head under, I don't. I like to, you know, especially if the water's cold because it starts knocking my core temperature down. However, that being said, some of the shots, which I love, uh, require me to be under as deep as the pool is. So some of these pools are 10 feet. You know, I'll wait myself down. I'll go down. I'll hold myself down there for 90 seconds and do a few takes, you know, with the dogs. And I'm 10 feet under the water. So I think my favorite shots to do are probably when I'm a few feet under and I'm able to drag a ball down and interact with the dog or hold – Go down to the bottom and hold the ball up, and the dog jumps down, and it can even take it out of my hand. And I'm down seven, eight feet. The dog swims down five, six feet, and I just literally put the ball out here, and they grab it. Do you, do you often have an assistant throwing the ball in, or are you doing it that way all the time? Where you're, you're It's usually one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I play these different games with the dogs to create these photos, and most of the time I keep it one-on-one -on -one because I want that dog working with me and for me. So when you start bringing in other elements around you, even the dog owner, it starts getting confusing. Who's the dog? supposed to be working with and working for who's the dog's teammate here so I try as much as I can where it's one-on-one -on -one. Um, but sometimes like if I'm 10 feet down and you know the idea is the dog is gonna dive off we have a diver to dive off and grab the tennis ball sometimes the dog won't be able to see the ball and then I'll have somebody on land just give it a toss and they'll dive down but you'd be surprised sometimes I'll be down 10 feet I'll hold that ball up to the top and that dog will see it, and it will come down, and I'll release the ball, and then I'm taking my picture. So even with that, I can do one-on-one. -on -one. But it's super important that we're teaming up. So okay. I, I like to have that. I do that very quickly when I meet the dog. Meet the owner, everything's cool, but I try to establish that relationship super fast so we are teammates. Okay. And now I, I don't want to keep you too long because we're, we're getting uh, shorter on time. So I want to go to the next, another subject is you're starting to do some, you're doing other things besides just dogs and cats. And I have shown one cat photo. But you got to go up to Alaska recently, didn't you? Yeah, I went to Alaska last uh, August, like late August, early okay. September for the New York Times. It's pretty flattering when the New York Times calls you and Absolutely. says, we want, we want to hire you. <laughs> so <laughs> so they, they just trusted in me that I would do a good job. They sent me into Alaska, uh, flew into Anchorage, went to Cooper Landing for three days, documenting the spawning and migration of sockeye salmon in the Russian River okay. uh, and the Upper Kenai. Now, I showed somebody this photo today, and I'm showing this, the, the, the red-eye salmon uh, the shot there, and the first thing they asked me is, "Why that guy put a sweater on that fish?" <laughs> that's what I. That's what I said too when I saw it <laughs> and, the first time. And I said, "You think he captured a fish and put a sweater on it?" <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Well, a lot of people they've never seen them. A lot of people haven't even seen you know sockeye salmon that are spawning. They've never seen pictures of them, or they've never seen them in person. It's incredible how vivid they are. I mean, it's yeah. magnificent, especially when you see them. You know, thousands and thousands all together. It's just. It's red, 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 and they, of course, they get this. The males get this crazy kite. Their head changes; it turns bright green. I mean, they look like they kind of look like fish monsters. <laughs> yeah, that one does look like it's, uh, it could put a hurting on you. That that fish I see there, and I only have the one photo from that I got from from that. But you have some more on your website that people can go see because uh, yeah. you also took some photos of, I guess, guys, people fishing there, and how it looked like the one I saw. There were the people and bears were pretty close together, and and what they were doing there. Oh, man. I mean, it, it, it is true. And I actually got in trouble for d photographing bears while I was there. Some people got upset that I was doing that because my assignment was photographing fish Yeah. Uh, and the story of the fish. It said, hey, tell the story of the fish. So I did. And throughout the course of telling that story, we happened to come across six grizzly bears in a day. Just yeah. being in public, really public places. We, Funny enough, we were way off the beaten path on, on some of our uh, – 
some of our assignment, and we were off in the middle of nowhere, and we didn't come across any bears. We came across all the bears where there was a lot of people. Yeah. And I happened to have my, of course, my online online camera too, and I documented the bears a little bit, and them interacting with the fish. And it was fascinating, and some people didn't like that. They said, oh, you're too close to the bears. Um, yeah, I mean, I would never encourage people to be close to bears. Sure. But certainly in Alaska, sometimes you're in a public place, there's other people, there's people fishing, the bears come along. I mean, it's, but safety is the number one priority. But I'm really happy that the bears were part of this assignment because they are part of the story. Absolutely. They're, you know, the, the, the fish... They feed have, off of them. Yeah. The bear is a big part of the fish's life. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and vice and versa. I, this shot of the bear they publish is the bear holding a sockeye salmon. I shot it at a, a, a slower shutter speed, so the fish is actually still moving around. The fish is actually splashing, and the bear is holding it and looking straight at me. And it's my favorite shot that I did of the bears there in Cooper Landing. Yeah, I like that one too. So, so what's next uh, for Seth? Uh, so next up, of course, we're doing One Picture Saves a Life. We're yeah. doing that campaign starting in April. Uh, appearances all over the country, workshops, they're open, free and open to the public. So feel free to sign up if you'd like to learn something about shelter pet photography. We could use your help. Releasing my kid's book called Underwater Dogs Kids Edition this September. It's going to be some new... New photographs of the dogs underwater in rhyming verse. So targeting kids 2 to 10. You know, some of the shots in Underwater Dogs, the book, maybe are too primal for some kids. But I, I got to tell you, a lot of kids that I know, even three-year-olds, they think they're all hilarious. Yes. So anyway, the book is going to have all family-friendly shots, curious, silly, playful, not a lot of the bared teeth shots. Uh, so that'll come out in September. Really excited about that. And then working on my new book, Underwater Puppies. That's yeah, going to be awesome. Which I'm shooting basically now until November, and that'll come out in the fall of 2014. And you you sell – so I know on your, on your website you have the calendar. You can buy a dog calendar. I, I've got to buy one of those for my wife, by the way. She's, yeah. yeah. She will love that. Uh, so you can buy the calendar. You Can you also buy – so uh, these photos, are, are they client photos, or are they a mix between client and, and like maybe a model thing? Um, can if it was a client photo, was there a release where you can sell these to the yeah, public? Yeah, there was a release. Yeah, okay. these are actually client dogs. You know, okay. people hiring me. They want this special service. Um, come in, do the photo shoot. They sign, uh, you know, kind of a generic photo agreement saying I can do this and this. So, I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, I photograph, and a lot of the time, people don't know this too. I work with. I do these special underwater shoots in different cities where I'm photographing 25 dogs in an afternoon. And they're all hiring me for 20 minutes at a time, 30 minutes at a time. So I get to meet a lot of dogs along the way. You know, those dog owners are getting a couple of winning shots that, that they can have and put it up on their wall. And then for me, it's great because I can find the best of the best moments yeah. uh, thanks to all these dogs. And people can go on your website and order a lot of these photos that we've shown tonight. I, I got all of these off your website, I believe. Uh, so people yeah, can yeah. There. People can order prints. I sell art prints at all sizes. Um, that's been a lot of fun, just shipping prints around the world and getting pictures back of people who put up a seven-foot <laughs> print of an underwater dog. It's amazing to see that. It's pretty flattering. I'm like, wow. Now, as, as popular so, as, you, as, as, as crazy as things have gotten for you, as popular as uh, you've gotten, are you, do you still have time to take on new clients? I've I got to imagine that you're getting a flood of requests from people wanting to hire you. Oh, man. Well, I'm not doing too – I used to just look forward to doing um, – you know, one or two commissions a month if I could scrape those together. Yeah. And that was always a problem. I'm like, I can't get enough business. And now I've got a waiting list of about 4,000 clients. 4,000. That's They're awesome. all willing to pay 1,000 for on land and $1,400 for underwater. I mean, I'm like, wow. And I'm not even doing any right now because I'm, I'm just sort of overwhelmed with everything else. But maybe one day I'll get back out there. It's a good problem to have. I'm like, wow, what am I supposed <laughs> to do? Now you, so I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, uh, but uh, you know we've had a number of, prof of people who are professionals. No, I don't think anybody who's had the the rise that you have had. But uh, I often hear a common theme is the hire some of the stuff out. So maybe not the shooting itself, but you know if you need help with right. the you know you probably already did this. You need a publicist or something like that. There's certain certain things that you can hire out and uh, continue to grow the business. A so four thousand client backload I don't know what you do about that <laughs> but if somebody does want to hire you they go through your website and and just sign up there yeah I mean I'm gonna do another tour again where I'm going across the country and then okay. in other parts of the world too so I'm gonna do those again um, I'm gonna start picking that up and I'm actually been trying to hire people to help me out I've just been so overwhelmed with traveling for everything I haven't even had a chance to hire you know the right teammates to help me out do you um, 
does your website have uh, you know any kind of uh, itinerary where you're going to be in different parts of the world? Like if you ever come to Atlanta, how how would I yeah, know you coming yeah. to Atlanta? Yeah, so I update my news, kind of my news events section, and when I start doing my tour again, like when people can hire me, I'll be I'll be posting that information. I'm actually doing a special shoot in Chicago, okay. um, which is available to the public. You can sign up, and that's going to be in May. Um, so I'm going to be back there doing that. I think it's May 12th. And then I'm doing a special underwater dogs event in Denver on May 18th and 19th. Again, if you're in the Denver area, you can sign up and do that. So I have those two events planned. I still like to get my practice in, so I like doing these special shoots with these adult dogs or puppies because it's just you never know what you're going to get. It's super exciting. I like to just to keep uh, on my toes and, and you know keep shooting almost every day if I can. So the the uh, everybody out in chat saying how long to you get your own TV series? That's the your own TV <laughs> show. Your dog whisperer got it. I gotta imagine this would be f more even more fun to watch. You know what, man? Look, <laughs> if the TV people give me a TV show, I will be on there. We've been working on it for a little while. You know, yeah. will happen. I mean, everybody. I'm in LA right now. Everybody here that you come across walking to the coffee shop has a TV show in development. <laughs> yeah, you know. I don't know. Would I love to do it? I think it would be a lot of fun. Uh, will it ever happen? I don't know. Well, you you did an awesome job on Duck Dynasty. Which when I first saw you come on, I thought, oh, that's this is not going to be good. They're not going to treat him well. But they're good people, and I was very happy at the end. You know, when when he looked at the photo and said, you know what? I can't remember the exact words, so I'm not going to say this right. You know what? That Seth really knows what he's doing. And they gave you at the end. They gave you a compliment after making you rake the leaves and that kind of stuff. But you know. <laughs> From that, your I think your personality came through. I think you'd do great on TV show. Hey man, thanks. I had a lot of fun going down there. I mean, it, it definitely seems like they were kind of giving me a hard time, but they really are. They're good people. Uh, they treated me very well, and I had a lot of fun. And if they said, "Hey Seth, come back on again," I would be happy to. Yeah. Well, Seth. Uh, speaking of that, I don't want to keep you too much longer. We have gone. Uh, a little bit less than an hour, so I'm going to cut it off before we get to the hour. I can we can keep going for a long time, but I don't want to abuse you. And I know you got a lot going on, so thank you very much for coming and sharing with us. Um, everybody out in chat, you know, I, I've shown a bunch of photos, but there's a lot more on his web page. You know, be sure to go there and, and look at that and your Facebook page. I didn't mention your Facebook page. You have got a, a great following there, and you po you posted a photo today, a new photo I hadn't seen today on Facebook. So you know, make sure to follow us. Uh, Seth on Facebook. It is Little Friends for Photo. Oh, it's in the, ch in the chat page. Yeah. And, and we, just put it in the, we just put it in the chat. It'll be in the show notes. So you can watch, and that's where we probably keep up with you the best on what's coming up new is on Facebook and your website. Totally. Yeah. All right, Seth, thank you very much, and good luck thank in you, all Seth. you do in the future. And if you get your TV show, I am definitely going to be watching. I'll TiVo that and watch it every <laughs> week. <laughs> awesome, man. And well, I'll keep you posted. Yes, thank you. Thank you again. Good night. Right, thanks again. Cheers. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you want to hang out longer? Or, um, we can keep going if you want. I just I wanted to give you an option to to leave if you wanted to, Seth. Are you still there? Oh, whatever. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Can just, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I, I, I was going to go ahead and, and uh, do, do the back end of the show where we talk about, um, you know, just the things that we go, have going on in our group, the Facebook page. We do a photo challenge every, every, every month to get people encouraged to go out and shoot. We need to do one on dogs or, or cats coming up soon, too, uh, in honor of okay. the show. But we're going to go over a few things like that. You're welcome to hang around if you want, or I know you're crazy busy, and it's probably dinner time there. Yeah, I'm probably going to get back to some work. I got some people calling me, yeah. looking for looking for something. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Seth. Uh, it was, it was yeah, a real pleasure. That. That was fun. Real pleasure to talk to you, and uh, good luck in everything you do in the future. Good luck. Yeah, sounds yeah. good. And if you guys want to chat again sometime, maybe when the new book's out or whenever later in the year, next year, oh, yeah, give me a shot. I would love that because I'm looking at a list of all the questions I had for you, and we got through a lot of them, but there's a lot more that I didn't get to. But you yeah. know, I want to be um, respectful of your time, and we would love when you do another book or whatever. Anytime you want to come on, you just tell me. Okay, cool. But I'll be reaching back out to you, I'm sure. Uh, sounds good, man. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. again, guys. Good night. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, guys, that was. Oh, well, I gotta get us back on the show. Back on here. That was awesome. He was he was so generous to hang out with us that long. Um, that's not good. Hold on. There we go. 
Tim, he was so generous to, to hang out with us that long. Because right, you weren't expecting him to last that long. And, uh, I was not, that, was, that was really good. You know, I, looking back on it, and I don't have like a full inventory of everything he's ever done, but looking back on it, I think the longest interview he's ever done was 18 minutes. And I really, I really wanted to be careful about his time because, like you mentioned, he's got a 4,000 client backlog. <laughs> I can't even what? imagine that. What professional? Who said, yeah, I, can I be number four thousand and one? <laughs> what professional photographer? And we got some professional photographers out in chat right now. I'm sure would not want to have that kind of backload. I mean, we of all the people we've had on the show, and we've had some really incredible people on the show. I don't think anybody's had that kind of backlog. And look how he was so he would he would have kept going with us. Yeah, he would have. He would have kept going with us. I think he was enjoying it. Yeah, well, which you is know, good. I mean. Yeah, you know, he's got a great story to tell. He's got some amazing photos. Some of those uh, pictures underwater, I would never have imagined that's what the face of a dog would have looked like underwater. I know. And, and what, um, what it shows is that he has a true passion for what he's doing, and he, he could have kept going and talking about it. And I know he was probably getting phone calls uh, the whole time because when we did the pre-show last night, he was getting calls the whole time we were doing the pre-show. So uh, we did, I didn't want to go too much into Duck Dynasty because I think that's, you know, uh, that's a favorite. It's a good show, uh, a show of mine. I love that show now, but it's just one of the things he does. And we didn't go over too much of how the explosion happened with him. So I'll, maybe I'll talk about that here now. Yeah, he, he said his underwater shots are fourteen hundred dollars. So he has gone up a little bit in his price. And you're thinking if you got four four thousand backload, then maybe your price is still too low, even at fourteen hundred dollars. Yeah, that's just yeah, really amazing. But and I, and I couldn't get it exactly right, so don't. Don't quote <clears throat> quote me on this. Hold on a second. I guess you don't have to quote me because I'll be on video saying it. But my understanding is that he was he was getting maybe two hundred um, views or so a week a day, two hundred uh, views on his web page a day. He had uh, somewhere around four thousand, five thousand, six thousand, something like that likes on his Facebook page, and somebody took one of his photos and shared it on Google Plus. And then shared it on um, Reddit. He mentioned Reddit. They shared it on Reddit. And literally overnight, like he woke up the next morning or came home from a shootout. I don't remember which one it was. And his web page was crashing all the time because instead of 200 a day, it was 100,000 a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> he had a ton of um, orders. So it was just, you know, crazy number of orders. I think somewhere he had like a thousand messages from people, and his Facebook likes went up to forty thousand within a few days. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and now if you look at it, it's a hundred and fifty something thousand likes. All of this, uh, you know, in all the TV shows and all those things he's done, are since last February two thousand twelve, I believe. He was doing a lot of work before that, so you know, he's he's had talent and he's gotten good show to, good shots before then. But he, this growth, this meteoric, meteor, how do you say that? Meteorotic, how do you say that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, growth has happened since last February. Just absolutely amazing. And he is still so down to earth and handles it so well. You know, I remember he was been on the list for a long time. And then when I, I was sitting there watching Duck Dynasty and I had already sent him an email. And I'm sure I got lost in the, the sea of emails that he receives. I'm sitting there watching Duck Dynasty, and I hear one of them say, uh, I hired the pet photographer, Seth Castile. And I said, what? What did he say? So I rewinded that, <laughs> and I listened to it, and, it, and he said it again. So I said, wait, that can't be the same guy. So then uh, when he came on the show, I said, oh, crap, it is the same guy. Well, there goes that. I'll never get him on the show. And you know what? Within a few days, and I'm watching a rerun, so I'm not watching it live. Within a few days, he emailed me back. You're right. I can't imagine how many emails he must get a day. Yeah. He's got a backlog of 4,000 customers. Uh, that's a scary thought. Yeah. So, great show. I was, I was so happy to have him on. Um, and I'm glad, you know, you guys came out and, and, and did that and watched him. And I uh, I know I missed some of your, your questions there, but I had to pay attention to what he was saying. So, hopefully, we got through a lot of the questions. I know there's some questions about lenses. He does use a... Uh, a wide angle lens for a lot of the, the underwater shots, at least, and probably some of the ground on, uh, above ground. He so must because he said he's pretty close to the action, and and yeah. it, the dogs look relatively like four feet away. So that's got to be a very close in if he's got a wide angle lens. Yeah. So the next thing uh, I want to talk about. So as we head out, so last week we had Topaz Labs, 
And I think by now the the four winners have received all their emails. And, and if you have not received an email with your code that you need in order to uh, activate it, you know, let me know. But I think I've heard from everybody that they have gotten their email now from Topaz Labs. If you didn't win something, like me and Tim, you didn't win something, and you want to buy something from Topaz Labs, JPEG Raw now has an affiliate program with Topaz Labs. So you can uh, go to the website and click on the Topaz Labs link, or you can just do www.topazlabs.jpegtoraw.com, uh, and that'll go there. I purchased the bundle as well. Yeah, so Tim purchased the bundle, but didn't use the Topaz Labs link. Yeah, I didn't know it. you got to me afterwards. Yeah, no, he bought it too soon. So it took a little bit to set it up. But if you said could, I was buying it last week, <laughs> I know it took me a little bit to do it uh, to get it set up. You got to go through their their whole process. But if you haven't bought it yet, you know, go through that, and the show will get a little bit of credit. The other thing is, we have now ended the March contest, which was signs. So I need to put a post in the Facebook group. But you know, now between now and this weekend. Uh, I guess maybe Sunday. Between now and Sunday, we need to everybody needs to go out there and vote on the on the signs photos. And uh, I will put a post out on Facebook. And the new the new subject has started. Gina Perry, who was a winner last month, got to choose the the thing and has an awesome graphic, the best graphic I've seen uh, so far. Uh, and that is the spring the the, the next thing spring. is spring. Yeah. So go out there and. Uh, start. I think she's already created the the album. Go out there and, and post your things for the spring contest. And I'm not gonna. Whoever wins the March, the signs one. I'm not gonna say you have to choose this, but at some point we should have. <laughs> at some point, we should have something related to pets. But choose whatever you want. Uh, Gina knows. I I try not to influence the uh, the winner. Let them pick whatever they want to pick. Right, Gina. Try not. <laughs> I try not. I try not. Um, so, I th yeah. I think we we have that. We don't have any contests. We have we have guests lined up all the way to the end of May. Although we have we have one week at the end of April that we're not going to be on because I I'm going to be traveling, uh, so I won't have that one. And then the end of May I'm going on a cruise, so we won't have something there. But between now and then we have we have guests each week. If you you know, if you don't make it to the live show, which most people do not, if you don't make it to the live show, you know, there's a number of ways you can subscribe through the iTunes, Stitcher Radio. We're getting more and more people through Stitcher Radio. And I had, last week, I had to put a special note in the audio because I felt bad for the audio people because, you know, the shows are often talking about photos. We talked about photos tonight. It did help that Seth wasn't seeing those, so we had to describe them. So right. people, who, people who are listening through audio... Get, maybe got a little bit better description. But last week, I think, if you were listening to that, I'm not sure how good it was to listen to it without seeing the video. Um, so we, we try and keep that in mind. If, if, you know, if you want to s stay subscribed to the audio, you can go, still go to like YouTube or something like that and see the videos where you want to see them. Cruise Endless Buffet, somebody says. Yeah, you know, so what I need to do is lose some weight before the cruise. Otherwise, I'm gonna, it's not going to be good. No. Yeah. You know, I almost brought down, I have a box of Peeps upstairs, and I was going to bring them down and, and have them behind me, and I forgot. Yeah, see, Peeps don't last long around me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good thing to peep, the whole Peep season is over. Yes. They're not <laughs> fattening, though. There's zero, like, zero fat in them. Oh, Are you, you ever kidding me? There's, there's zero no fat. Su you, look at, you look at the label on there, there's no fat. There's a high sugar content, but it's a marshmallow. There's nothing in a marshmallow. Okay, so... so and this probably should be after the show, but we're still in the actual show. So, but I'll go ahead and say it anyway. Next week, my wife is going to cruise with some of her other teacher friends. So it's just me and the boys here. And you know what happens whenever the the responsible parent leaves and leaves me in charge? <laughs> <laughs> anything, I'm afraid. Anything we want. So you know, I'm you know telling the boys where. So what are we going to have? Like ice cream for breakfast? <laughs> you know. Peeps for dinner. Yeah, that, that's one way to lose the weight before the cruise. <laughs> <laughs> or we can, you know, I don't want to go off on these tangents. What, what will boys do? Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll be good. See, even Jim says peeps for dinner. Waffle, Waffle House, House, three, three meals, meals a day. day. Who is photo... Who knows that I work at Waffle House? That was Jim. Oh, that was Jim. Okay. Oh, cinnamon rolls for I think lunch. everybody knows. <laughs> 
All right. Um, what else do we have to, to close us out? Was there any other questions out in chat before we go? Yeah, any other questions out in chat? Um, and Tim, uh, so I don't get to say this enough. I wanted to thank Tim. Tim does such a great job of taking notes during the show. And, uh, you know, what I have missed a lot, I, I don't notice this until I go back through and look at the show notes, that how many links you've embedded during the show. I try. Like, and look at that. And some of them, like that, that, that Pooja sound, I was like, what did he say? How do you spell that? And I had to find it. It was like, oh, it's up in Washington. This has got to be it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that really helps me out a lot. So I appreciate that. Today um, was a good today was a good one for notes. He was easy to take notes on. He was. What is s'mores? Graham waffles with melted marshmallows. Oh, somebody's explaining s'mores. <laughs> Gina Perry. It's a Girl Scout I, thing. I, well, maybe she. Maybe she. And uh, that's, oh, that's an American right. thing. She, she's. Uh, maybe she's it's across an, the pond. Yeah, maybe it's an American thing, and and uh, they don't have s'mores over there. S'mores are very, very sweet. I don't know. I love them. <laughs> yeah, so you know, we go camping. You usually bring all this stuff for s'mores, and you eat one, and you go, okay, that's, that's so much. Maybe you eat two, but it gets, it's so much that you can't eat that many. Because it is, it is, to me, it's very, very sweet. All right, so let's, who do we have? Next week we have... I don't even know what type of photography he does, but Andy. And then the week after that, we have. Uh, where's my calendar? Why don't I have a calendar? No, I'm getting it. At the wrong month pulled up. May. No, April. At least the website held up. Mike, make them with peeps. Oh, so s'mores with peeps. Oh, God, you talk about sweet. <laughs> All the sugar on the peep already. I'm going to go upstairs and have a couple. So next week is Andy uh, Kennelly. Week after that is Sarah Cornish again. We've had, having her back on. Haven't had her in a while. Yeah, Sarah Cornish. There is a challenge between her and Rachel on who can bring the most people to a live show. So you know. Well, Rachel, what was the top number we hit on a, on a live show? It was up close to 500, if not no, broke. No, 225. You sure? I thought it was higher than that. No. So. When Sarah, Sarah had the record, and she said, if anybody ever beats it, you let me know, and I'm going to come back and beat it. So we'll see if she, if she can. Um, so Sarah Cornish then. Then at the end, uh, we're taking a week off. At the end of April, we have Melissa and Jared, uh, a, a fem uh, husband and wife photo team. Uh, then in May, I think this is where we're going to hit uh, Gina Perry's person. In May 7th, we have Rob and Laura. Lauren, Robin Lauren from Photo Concentrate. I don't know if you've even looked at them. They're pretty, nah. interesting. They're pretty interesting. Then uh, later in the month, we have uh, Danielle, uh, which is Gina Perry's person that Gina Perry sent, sent me. Yes, uh, I did say Sarah Cornish. Sarah Cornish is coming in two weeks for her return. I should, what, here's what I need to do, Tim. I need to do the official end of the show, and then we can just chat afterwards. <laughs> so let me go ahead. There you and, go. Let me go ahead and do the official end of the show. We thank you know everybody out in chat. You can hang around. We'll do some talk after this. But thank you so much for coming. It's a great show with with Seth Castile. He is an amazing pet photographer. Who uh, it was. We are honored that he would share some time with us tonight, uh, and we really we really appreciate it. Uh, until next week, keep it raw. <laughs>